Welcome back, Troy, which is me. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> um, and while I was gone, you rearranged the studio. I started to. We are kind of sitting in chairs now that are more... These Actually, these chairs are way more comfortable than those director chairs or whatever the... Whatever they were, I, I literally am grateful for these chairs. Well, the other chairs that we were using, the director's chairs, every mm. time you moved, they squeaked. And, yeah. and they were just uncomfortable. I felt like a little kid because it was all up high on me because I was so short with the table that we use. And then they squeezed you. Anyways, that's a, a done deal. So we have some trucking stuff to talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's almost the end of the year. And... Uh, I think you have a little article about the 12 days of Christmas mm -hmm. from uh, Loves. Loves. Loves is putting on a promotion, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I found a little article, a trucker hit the lottery. Oh, yeah? I yeah. seen that. Oh, you did? Yeah, but you got to tell us I'm about hearing, it. I'm hearing noise. There we go. Um, yeah, I, I do want to tell you about it, and I want to give the trucker a warning. <laughs> after you read the article, you're going, what? Um Anyways, and I'd like to talk about also a couple tips. I read an article. I'm going to read it. You can agree with it or you may disagree with it. It's about going into a jackknife and what to do. I mean, honestly, there's there's a couple things that are scary to a trucker. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that. Um, but let's, if we can, mention our sponsors and we will get on with the show. And... Uh, do some talking. That's what you're best at. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> um, okay, so our first sponsor of the week is National Carriers. You know, drivers, if you're, and this is the truth, right now it's tough in the economy. Um, a lot of drivers are finding it tough, you know, to at least do lease purchases and everything. Um, here's a company that actually is owned by their own freight, mm -hmm. National Carriers. And it's steady work, good income. Um, call them 888-311-7076. They got beautiful trucks, regional runs, over the road runs. They got everything. Call them at 888-311-7076. And, uh, just to mention Carter Lumber also is another trucking company. That's a sponsor of the show, Ruthann. Mm -hmm. They have 160 plus locations east of the Mississippi. And they're also looking for not only class A and class B drivers for local work, but they also hire drivers that don't have CDLs. Mm -hmm. So they actually have driving jobs if even if you don't have your class a or your class b so go to carterlumber.com forward slash talk cdl let them know you heard about them heard about them rather on talk cdl that's carterlumber.com forward slash talk cdl and last but not least ruthann drive wise drive wise actually i love them because everything is really app based anymore mm -hmm. and they were smart enough to, you know, make DriveWise an app-based company where a driver or a small fleet can just download their app and they are bypassing the scale. Mm -hmm. There's so many advantages to DriveWise and I'm hearing it's it's less in cost. So, you know, they don't have to have the cost of sending transponders or anything so they can offer a better price. It's DriveWise, D-R-I-V-E-W-Y-Z-E dot -E com. And always tell them, Talk CDL sent me over here. So they can know that their commercial is working here on the show, Ruthann. <laughs> um, so I want to I want to talk I want to talk real quick about this. Wait a second. First of all, there's nothing you say when you talk that's real quick, except for no. You'll say no fast, but there's nothing else that you can ever say that will be real quick. Well, all right. So I'm going to take my time. I'm going to talk a lot about this. At least you're honest now. Jackknife. Jackknifing. You know, there's certain things now as, as a truck driver, there's certain things that, um, truckers fear, mm -hmm. you know, when they get, when they leave every day on the road, there's certain and things they fear. One of the, the, to me, it was never a jackknife that I feared. It was always a low bridge because I never wanted to look like a real dummy, <laughs> you know, and not that a driver that hits a low bridge is a real dummy because you could... If, and, and we're not going to talk about low bridge as much, but just think about this. You Sometimes you have a lot on your mind. Yes, you're supposed to be a professional driver, but there's a lot of drivers that they, they 
right away they're quick to judge you. Oh, he's a dummy because he it was a 12-6 bridge and he had a 13-6 trailer, blah, blah, blah. And they're quick to judge each other. But you know what? A lot of times the guy that's out judging ends up getting having the same thing happen to himself. Again, you could just have a lot on your mind. You didn't pay attention. And boom, you're under a low bridge. That was my big fear. Mm-hmm. Um, many big fears truck drivers have of maybe not paying attention and rear-ending traffic. But one of them... One of the biggest fears in trucking is jackknifing. I, I would say that'd be one of the biggest for me, too. Yeah, jackknifing, you know, obviously, this is the time of the year. It's now December, and, um, you know, it's supposed to be a rough winter this year, which means lots of storms. And, you know, what's funny is a lot of drivers, they don't realize that the snow actually comes down to sometimes even into Georgia. I mean, we've we've had a little bit of snow in northern Florida. Mm-hmm. But realistically, a lot of the a lot of snowstorms. Sometimes Tennessee, you know, hit gets hit. Yeah. Kentucky, um, the Carolinas sometimes. And the worst part is, like for example, North Carolina when they get a snowstorm, there's absolutely zero knowledge on road. You well, know. yeah, south of that, anywhere from south of that point is they don't have that knowledge. Well, they don't have as far as road clearing. Mm-hmm. Like the, the ability, they might have some knowledge, but they don't have the capacity and ability to control that. Well, uh, like for example, where we're from, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and I was just talking to somebody the other day. Depending on the township you live in in Pennsylvania, they actually the township buildings actually have big piles of cinders and and, mm-hmm. and, and salt, and you're you're welcome to just go there, back in, load your pickup truck. And go salt and center your driveway, and, mm-hmm. and every, which is really cool. But like in North Carolina, probably Virginia too, they get snow and ice. They don't, like you said, they don't have the capacity to clear the roads. Mm-hmm. And the threat of going into a jackknife is there. I think with those states also, the southern states, they don't have the coal burners and stuff like up north. So they don't have the cinders. And they don't generally use salt, so I think they use sand, don't they? A lot of them. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not actually sure, but I think you're right. I don't. They I, use sand. I don't think they use the salt. And you know, that's. You know, I don't want to get into it, but that's why when you get north of the Mason Dixon line, you see cars that are filled with what's called cancer falling apart because of the dang salt. Mm-hmm. That's why in the in the South, when we moved to the South a couple decades ago. I noticed everything down here is like in good condition, you know. Except for when you know there is a person from up north in their vehicle still. Yeah, you we, see the rust spots. Yeah, when you see a vehicle with cancer, you know some guy drove it down yeah. here. When, when you see it going across like the running board in the bottom there, you know, from it splashing up. So jackknives. Jackknives. Um, you know, here's an article I read on how to get out, basically how to get out of a jackknife. And we're just getting used to this new setup here, so I've got to get... Well, we have to get a few more. We need a teleprompt. You know, you know those things that yeah. they they read off of. And well, we could you need set one, our. You need one on the wall over there. Well, you know what? I bet if we put one of the screens up and just use an Epson. Yeah, how to handle a jackknife. PowerPoint so, our our podcast. What's that? PowerPoint our podcast. Yeah. Here's what it says: it says there there are many situations that are not. There are not many situations scarier than a jackknife skid for a professional truck driver. It's true. I I agree. I mean, you got, you've got one of the things I'm going to tell you, there's many people that give advice on, on jackknifing. I'm going to tell you my story on jackknifing here in a little bit, but many people agree and disagree, but I'm going to guarantee you the one thing. That everybody, when everybody's given advice and everybody gives different advice on jackknifing, I've heard different advices, Mm -hmm. but the one common advice in order to come out of a jack, if you're going to come out of it, at least in a high person, like say you went into 10 jackknifes, if you're going to come out of, out of most of them unscathed, it's going to be because you remained calm. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's not easy to do when all of a sudden you look in one of your mirrors and your trailer's coming up alongside you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people's reaction 
in most situations is hit the brakes. Is hit the brakes. Mm -hmm. So the first step, if you go into a jackknife, and I'm going to tell you, drivers, this is the truth. If you practice this in your mind, you'll be prepared for it. If you're right now driving down the road and you're listening to me and this is one of your fears, you should start getting it into your head that if by chance I go into a jackknife, I'm going to remain calm and I'm going to attempt to follow instructions I've heard. And you could take different advices, put it together, but I here's what I believe with them. I believe each situation is different. Mm -hmm. And it and by the way, remaining calm and acting quickly is what you need to do. So it says most truck driver training schools don't spend enough time teaching the skills needed properly to handle this type of situation. And that's true. Most most um trucking schools, and I think that they actually have you remember years ago. I heard of a place that was offering skid pad training mm -hmm. and where they take you and put you into a jackknife. And I think it's somewhere in the Midwest. I don't know if it's still there. I don't know if it went over big enough where trucking companies were interested in sending their drivers there. But I believe that's a great, a great, um, uh, I'm course. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I believe it's a great course that somebody could probably build a um a business with just mm -hmm. teaching truckers how to and just imagine i would imagine this if there was a place like this i would imagine insurance companies would also give the trucking companies a break if they were to put put their drivers through this professional course on skid training i'm just just my guess I, I honestly, if I had a trucking company and I did even half of my driving in anywhere where snow or ice or sleet or even rain was more prominent, then I would definitely send my drivers, especially the new ones that have under, you know, so much experience, I would definitely send them to some form of skid pad training because of the fact that even if it, whatever the cost is, it still would be worth it because one, equipment cost if it's damaged, two, the driver's life if it's if it's not there, or if it is there and he survives, yeah, um, a wreck from it. This the cost and the the um, rehabilitation of that driver, and also the freight loss. I mean, when you think of everything that's going on, and then you have the damages that are done to the other people. So the cost of doing skid pad training is, is extremely effective for drivers that just don't have that experience. Even if you have five years trucking, you might not have done enough of it up north to really get that feel for driving in the snow and the ice. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he clearly, in this article, by saying schools don't, you know, dabble in skid, you know, to be honest with you, schools and you hear drivers saying it, they're just driver mills. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they, uh, um, the, all they want to do is, you know, get their five to 10 grand per driver, get them through the course, get them tested, get them down the road so they can get another batch of students in. Correct. So with that being said, I would, I would, I would say that's bad of these schools. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not here to put people down, but at the same time, if if you're a school that has not considered the safety of the public in your training, when you could have a, and, and you know, I will say this though, like if you're a trucking school in the South, you know, the only way to create a skid pad would be, you know, a nice tarmac with a lot of water or some somehow, or even grease it up a little you know what i mean Wait, you they could, they could they could come up with a skid pad that's you know it doesn't have to be super greasy to where 
you know, it's almost impossible to, tr- to, to, um, you know, handle. Assimilate. Yeah, but they definitely should, and and they have simulators also, but there's nothing like the real. There's nothing like the real thing, and you can you can you can create fake snow. I mean, we have it down here right now. We have a couple of areas. One of them's in uh, Dade City, where they create fake snow and ice and and so forth. To you know, we don't have it. I mean, our temperatures right now it's 73 degrees here. That's not going to hold any snow or ni- snow or ice, but. They can make their substances that create that. So you can create a snow and ice situation in. Well, you got to be careful what you're saying, because in order for a school in the South have to have to do that. Now they got to spend a lot of money in order for a, a, a couple days of training. And a lot of them aren't going to create snow and ice, but they could create something slippery mm-hmm. in order to put a driver into a jackknife in in there. I, to be honest with you, there should be skid pad training should be almost mandatory in the, the curriculum for truck drivers because of of the, you know, the split second decisions you have to make um, in order to come out of it. If you were actually it's like, for example, everybody in the north, we were. When we were kids, we used to drive in the snow in our cars, mm-hmm. and we would go into parking lots, and we would go flying around, donuts. doing donuts and skidding and sliding. But as a kid, what did we learn? All my buddies and I, the first thing we learned was, okay, when you're driving and you're and you're flying and you hit the brakes, well, if you hold the brake down and you're steering to the right, your car or your pickup will go left. It's the same; would be the same principle. In a semi truck, your tractor, if if you're in snow and you panic and you hit the brakes and all of a sudden you're trying to steer to the right and you're going, why ain't I going left? And you're so panicked that you can't lift your foot. You're going to continue going to the left, even though you're steering to the right until you hit something or you come to a stop. Mm-hmm. And so in parking lots, it's really skid pad training for northerners. Uh, you know, we all we all had that in in like at night in the mall parking lots when nobody was there and in the high school and there was this in the high yeah the, up at the high schools we used to go flying around and 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 but you learn how to control your vehicle in playing like that and it would be no different for a trucker to get this training in order to obviously prevent the jackknife so. Going on with this advice here, he even says every professional driver has their own method for correcting a jackknife. And he's right. Every That's why I said in the beginning, everybody's going to give you different advice. Advice is like, you know, buttholes. Everybody has one. <laughs> I was waiting for your analogy, which one you're going to use. Well, it's, it's true. It's, 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 it's the same. You know, you just never know. And everybody, it's an opinion is, is like a butthole. Everybody has an opinion and everybody else thinks that everybody else is stinks. <laughs> Okay, so there's my analogy, all right? You know, so everybody that hears this article today, some of them are going to think that this article's butthole stinks. But personally, they all have their good advice. And like I said in the beginning, um, staying calm is number one. Just remember this throughout. Okay, so um, he says, if if you'd like to learn how um, this article does it, he says, how I do it, keep reading. Um, he's the, the, the driver says he's been a professional driver for 40 years. So for, if you got 40 years experience and obviously the guy's driven in bad weather, he wouldn't be talking about this. You know, I'd say he's worth listening to, you know, he's an experienced driver. He says he's driven all over the, all over North America and all types of weather and types of terrain, which makes him honestly, somebody you might want to listen to. He says he doesn't, um, uh, it says, I do know my method works for me and it can work for you as well. So he says, number one, he says, when you start, when you go into a jackknife, the first thing you need to do is get your tractor trailer straight. Keep a cool head and don't overcorrect. So I'm going to just start by just correcting his, his, his thing right away and say the number one step should be get your, get your mind, go right into your training. 
Okay, if you go into a jackknife today, tomorrow, whenever, this winter, get your mind ready. This is why I tell these drivers, while well, you're driving down the road, be, keep th- reminding yourself of this every day. Keep reminding yourself. Practice this. If you practice this in your mind, your mind will direct you when the time comes. If you just blow off advice, then when time comes, you're going, what was that advice again? And you only got a half a second to decide. This is something that could be life-changing. So get your mind ready. Okay, be prepared at all times for this. So there's that. So anyways, he says, keep a cool head and don't overcorrect. And he's going to explain that. He says, if your trailer is kicked out to the passenger side, so if you jackknife and it's coming around to the passenger side, he says, the best way to correct this is to steer into the direction of the skid, and which is very true. Everybody's heard this. If, you're, if your trailer's coming to the left, then you want to steer to the left, which is not most people's reaction would be steer away from the, here comes the object, let me steer away from it, right? That would be most people's reaction. But it's you're, you've got, and again, this is me telling you that you have to have your mind prepared for this. If you're not prepared to steer into the, skid then you're not then you're going to panic if you're not prepared to have your feet ready to do what he suggests and I do agree with a lot of his stuff here he says if your trailer's kicked to the passenger side you got to steer into the passenger side same with the opposite okay he then says it's important to steer gradually toward the skid so don't this is the part where you can't panic drivers you cannot go into a panic you can't just whip the wheel oh my god you know what I mean? I got to spin the wheel. It's not that. It's, it's okay, keep your mind. Okay, steer, steer. And you can probably judge it the way the trailer's going according to your speed. He says, do not turn the steering wheel hard into the skid. Don't just whip it. He says, do not overcorrect. This will help to counteract the sliding movement and help straighten the truck and trailer on the road. He says, the next thing to do is this. He says, take your feet completely off the pedals, which includes the clutch, fuel, and brake. Just take, he's saying this, take it, take them up. And I agree with this. I'm going to tell you this story here in a little bit. He says, your entire focus at this point, he says, your entire focus should, uh, should be on straightening your tractor trailer. Concentrate on steering to straighten. It's all you're doing. You're bringing it around. Just bring it around. And you don't go real slow. Don't don't think you got to baby it. Just steer according to your speed. He says, it is at this point when I attempt to slow down the, uh, the speed of the truck. He's going to suggest Jake brake. Okay. He says, exactly. He suggests the Jake brake. A lot of people disagree with that. Me personally, I do I don't know if I agree with the Jake break myself. I, I, I personally like. Well, but but the Jake break is going to slow the tractor down. It's going to slow the engine. It, it's right. It, it slows the engine down, like which the, slows which slows your 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 drive shaft. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're you're slowing it down by the engine instead of using your brakes. That's all it is. So if by chance. You hit that Jake brake and you don't have it set. It's, it goes into saying you could have it on three settings. You need to set it on the you know the one that doesn't slow you down as hard. And it can work. I'm not saying it won't work. He, he's saying once you got your tractor straightened out, a lot of people say use the trolley valve, which is the trailer brake, which now you're kind of pulling yourself instead of, you know, putting the pressure where the fifth wheel is. Yeah, like a parachute. Exactly. The trolley almost acts like the parachute versus the the uh, Jake brake or your tractor brakes. You're now going to be putting more pressure. Now you're putting pressure back on that fifth wheel, which could be uh, it could go into a slide again. Um, and, and again, it can work in different situations with the Jake and in certain j- situations it won't work with the Jake. So and he even goes into saying that um, drivers, a lot of drivers disagree with him. He says, some truck drivers will disagree with me when I suggest to use the Jake brake on your truck at this point. Use your own best judgment. And I agree with him. You've got to know your truck and situation at that moment. Okay. Um, he, he goes into saying, 
It's possible to use the Jake brake on a lower setting if the roads are excessively slippery, as there are three settings on the Jake brake. I got a question. Go ahead. If you are not, if you already have your feet off all the pedals, mm-hmm. and you're already turning into your your um where you're where you're turning into into the Jake or into the the slide, if you're already doing all that, um and you already have your Jake set, wouldn't your Jake brake already be activated to where you already got everything off? So it's already been activated when you're already started to, when you took your, your feet off the pedals and stuff. I mean, wouldn't it already well, if you, be activated? If you didn't hit your, if you don't, it's a little switch. You flick a switch and your Jake brake comes on. It's not automatic. No, I know that. But, you know, like when we drove... We had ours already on all the time. No, we didn't. But sometimes. Okay. No, we didn't have it on. I did. I liked the Jake. I did. Okay, well. So I would have it on. So I would <laughs> I would assume, you know, all right. most people are smart and would have it on. <laughs> but, but the Jake Except for break, when they're going through town and they're making them illegal. Yeah, but the Jake break can make you go into a slide also. You just got to be careful. You know, in in each situation, are you on ice? Are you on snow? Are you on sleet? Black ice? I mean, just really, there's. I'm going to tell you my story on 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 jackknifing here in a second. Um, so he says, then gently tap on the fuel, basically feathering the fuel. Okay, so what you're doing now is you're pulling. You're going from this. Right. Exactly. Right? You're going from this. From jacking. Turning into it to try and straighten it out, and, and as you're you feathering, straight- you're, you're 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 getting it to do this. Right, but you're still not steering away. Never steer away from the jackknife. He says, however, do this until you feel you are regaining control of the truck. I personally do not use the trailer brake to slow down when I'm in a jackknife skid. Again, it depends. I'm telling you, it really depends on what the situation you're in. I'm going to tell you my story here in a second. He says, when you feel you are finally in control of the truck and trailer, you can you can ease the truck and trailer over to the side of the road. He doesn't say this part, but this is the part where you can clean out your shorts from crap in your pants because there's sometimes it can happen. Uh, one time I was up on I-80 where 81 and 80 intersect there in Hazleton area, and um, this dude... Literally, I don't remember what company was with, but I was coming out, and it was packed icy snow, and I was headed west. And all I seen was the guy in front of me lock his brakes up, a rig, and his trailer started jacking. <laughs> and I had no choice. I had a western start at the time, and that thing had some guts. I punched it. And literally went to the left a little bit on the shoulder as his trailer was coming around. And I just got by it. Because if I wouldn't have done that, there's no way I would have stopped. It more of a pile up. Ex- well, yeah, I would have I would have hit him. And I looked in my mirror. His truck and trailer was completely across I-80. So I already know they were about to be backed up for a long time. I was the last guy to get through there. And I, you know, went on my way. And that was because I had, you have to make decisions. And a panic is not a decision. No. Just so you guys know this. Panicking is not a decision. It's, It's letting your fear... Take it's letting your fear make the decision that your 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 professional driving mind should have made for you, and now you're in most of the time fear decisions, decisions made in fear result in a bad thing. I'm not saying that every now and then you might panic and something works out right, but most of the time it does not. What happens when you go into a, a panic? The you get your brain has chemicals in it that react. The fight, fight or flight, you um, you have the different adrenalines, all that type of stuff. When you go into, when your heart races and your body's comprehending what's going on, that's what helps you get through situations. And if you're a person that when something happens, you're like, oh no, this guy's falling and you're going through a complete panic or, you know, like some people when they see blood, they just... It, it, it destroys them and mm-hmm. that kind of of thinking is not 
good when it comes to being on the road with 80,000 pounds with um, hazards around you, snow, ice, sleet, black ice, um, rain, any of those types of things. And it's also good to have the mentality of always knowing what to do. I mean, yeah, of course, there's going to be circumstances where it's going to arise where you're like, I'm not quite sure what I could do. But if you know the basics to at least stay calm, you can think through and you could think of the best possible scenario or situation that you can get through that, whether it be, okay, well, this has happened. Let's go ahead and start with this. And you could break it down. But if you're panicking, you can never get to those points of thinking how it's going to be best to break it down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I'm, I'm just going to keep telling these guys the, the best way to, and if you are a panicker and if you, you think, oh man, I'm a panicker. I, I, I'm so nervous. I'm scared. All you got to do is right now from this day forward is practicing your mind that when you come to that situation, you are going to be the guy that doesn't panic. Just practice. Go run scenarios through your brain. Uh, that okay. Here, what I'm, I'm in a situation here, and I jackknife. Okay, remain calm. Remain. Let me tell you my story. Um, this was one of the only times I was ever late delivering. I used to have this dedicated run, and you know it, um, out to Chicago every week. Every week, I used to run a reefer out there. Um, I would uh, I would pick up. LTL freight, bring it back to Pennsylvania, hand unload it. And then I would go to the, you know, Harrisburg and Allentown. I'd make all these pickups and I would head back to, um, Chicago with these, with the, the, the goods. And there was this ice storm, if you remember, um, in Northeast Pennsylvania, all the way across. It was, it was pure black ice. I, I want to say it was probably in like 1996, maybe 97. Um, I don't know. In, in that area, it was just really, really bad. Mid 90s. It was mid 90s, right? And uh, I was at the, the, uh, it used to be a, I forget the name of the truck stop. It used to be there in Pine Grove, not a TA. Not a loves, but it, oh, an all American used to be an all American there, and um, I literally had left that night, and I had to go really slow because the roads were really getting bad, and I and I got to the to the Pine Grove truck stop because that we lived out four forty three up that way, and when I got there, it was packed, everybody and their brother, and nobody was on the interstates. It was just bad. And everywhere you looked, you know, on the interstate, there was trucks flipped over. It was just trucks. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to park here at the truck stop and wait till daylight. All right. And morning came and I thought, all right, I'm going to start my truck up. I'm going to get going. Well, nobody was going except me. And I go out and I get on 81 and I... I start heading south, and as I'm coming down, I'm like, there's a set of yellow truck, a set of yellow pups upside down in the ditch. Now there's a roadway set of, of, there's a set of overnights. I mean, these are just, everywhere I go, FedExes, all these trailers, these doubles and, and singles, they're up, I mean, literally not just flipped over on banks or on in the medium, but they're up the banks on the right side. I mean, they were like... They just lost control everywhere. You could see that they were driving too fast the night before, and they just went into a skid, and until they hit something solid, they that's when they came to a stop. And that also makes you nervous because you see what's ahead of you. You're like, oh, my gosh, all these people are like this. Well, here's the deal. a little scared. It wasn't, there was no more precipitation. It was very cold. But, and the roads, this is the scary part. Now, here's the scary part. The roads looked perfectly clear. And I mean, they did not look wet. And I'm driving, and I'm like, now I'm picture this. I'm on an interstate 81 South, and I have to be. I'm weaving in and out wrecked trucks mm-hmm. slowly, and I'm doing maybe 25 miles an hour, maybe. And all of a sudden, my truck goes into a jackknife. 
Seriously. But here's the weird part. The trailer didn't come around. The tractor totally jacked to the left. My trailer was going straight down the interstate. And the trailer's just pushing me. My tr- my truck is going... I'm looking at the damn trailer. You're looking at the butt. <laughs> I'm looking at the trailer. You're looking at northbound. I'm looking... I'm literally <laughs> looking at... I'm, yeah, I'm facing northbound. And I'm looking at my trailer just pushing me down the road. The good news is there's nothing that I'm going to hit. And it's just pushing me right down the interstate. And I'm doing 25 mile an hour. Maybe 30. 25, 30. And I remember the advice of Gary... A, a guy I used to run with. He was a trucker that, and my grandfather, but Gary's voice popped into my head. And, and again, this is the situation I was in my mind was prepared for this. And so Gary, the one guy, you remember Gary, mm-hmm. he was, he lived in Maryland mm-hmm. and skinny smoker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Had a mean cat. But anyways, Gary told me, he said, you ever go into a jackknife? He said, get the weight off the fifth wheel. He said, just, he said, if you have to go into neutral, even do it. And I literally took my feet. This is, I'm telling you, this is what I did. I took my feet off the pedal, off the brake, off the clutch. And I popped it in the neutral at the same time. And because now this is the same principles when we were a kid with skid pads if you if you brake to the and steer to the left, your car goes right. If you brake and steer to the right, your car goes left. But when we were kids, we learned that when we took our feet off the brake, the wheels start turning and they start guiding you the way that you're pointed, which was really cool. So if you're skidding to the left and your wheels pointed to the right and you take your foot off the brake, it allows your wheels to start freely moving and it will go in the direction of the moving wheels. It's the truth. Mm-hmm. Well, so I did this, took the pressure off the fifth wheel, and literally, it my truck went whoop and straightened out. And now I'm just going straight. No word of a lie, Ruthann. I went and put it. I went to put it back in gear, and the damn thing did this. It did the same thing. Only only flip my tractor to the right now. And now I'm looking out the passenger window and I'm, I'm jackknifed again. Right. And it's pushing me down the road. I took, I, I took, I popped it back into neutral, took my feet off everything and, and was able to steer it back around. And you know what I did? I just waited for it to coast. Cause I was on flat land down, down towards, you know, I was down off the mountain now. And you were getting closer to the 78 split. Right. And what I did was I put it in a higher gear. Okay. And I literally was able to slow down. You probably don't remember. You probably remember me telling about telling you this. I called my dispatcher. I said, I'm not going to be in Chicago. I am going home. And I came back home that day. I got home and I left it like that for a day. And then I left the next day when they finally got the roads cleaned up because it took them a day. But that is a true story. I was able to come out of a jackknife on black ice like that. And that happened to me one other time in Chicago. Gary was actually with me this time. He was following me. We were leaving Chicago, heading back to the Northeast. And um, we came up, you know, that, that, that giant bridge where you could see all the big ravine dug out. It's like where they've been on 80, uh, on 90 it's, I think it's on 90, but it's, but anyways, it's, there's a, a section there as you're coming out of Illinois into Indiana or mm. wherever. And there's a, it, and I haven't been up there in years, but I would imagine it's the same. It's like this giant deep crater on both sides. And, uh, right as we came over that, it was black ice. Same exact thing happened. I was able to come out of the jackknife. So three jackknives that I went into hitting black ice, which is probably the worst out of everyone because black ice, it's the hardest, but drivers, here's the advice. If you notice when you get your feet off the pedal, when your wheel, your wheel will start turning freely and you will be able to control your rig, but you will never ever 
be able to do this if you don't keep a calm head. Mm-hmm. That's my advice on, on jackknifing. Um, there's many people that have other ways of, 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 of dealing with a jackknife, and, and, and it's probably saved them. So I'm not going to put down anybody's um, opinion. I think that with any situation, mm-hmm. but especially one like jackknifing or coming to an accident, you must keep your head calm because if you don't, you make the situation worse. Yeah, if that, you don't stay calm, you're going to make whatever situation worse, whether it be you're jackknifing or coming to an accident and you see a big accident up ahead of you. If you don't stay calm and know what you're supposed to do to safely stop your tractor or get around the situation, you are not. You can end up being part of that situation by either creating a jackknife yourself right before, because you can jackknife without being on ice or snow or anything. You can still jackknife when you're coming up to an accident just yeah. by slamming everything down. You don't want to do any of that either because you're going to create another, an, another a pre-accident to the one that you're trying to get to. I seen a guy videoing the other day, a rig had uh, in Texas was uh, jackknifed and uh, it was nothing but diesel fl- uh, fuel all over the highway. I guarantee you somebody could have jackknifed on that diesel fuel. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you're right. And, and again, I'm just going to say it. If you are a panicker, start practicing in your mind mm-hmm. because there's a good chance that you're going to have this situation someday. So we're not going to beat a dead horse. I think a lot of them get the gist on jackknifing. Um, well, here's, here's one, one quick thing. Sure. The drivers that are, are fairly new, black ice happens when it hits what degree? I don't know. I mean, 32 degrees. Okay. It, like you said, you can't see it. So if you're a new driver and are unfamiliar with black ice, get familiar with it, Google it. But it's just basically when you're, you're the roadway has a sheet of ice on it. And it doesn't look wet. And you, don't, you can't tell it's wet. And a lot of the drivers back when we drove, they had the thermostat that they had inside of their tractor. And it told them what the temp was outside to help prevent them from being out in black ice. Oh Yeah, you definitely, when you're driving in weather that is 33, you know, we were actually in this the other day. It was 33 degrees and, and we were in the mountains of West Virginia. And I kept saying to everybody, oh, it just hit 32 and then there was a mist. and But the good thing is there was a lot of traffic. See, that's the other thing you got to be careful of. If there's a lot of vehicles on the road, it's harder for the road to freeze. Mm-hmm. But if you're on a road that is less traveled and it gets down to that 32, 31 degrees and it's misty. It has know, bridges. And, and has bridges. Whether it has bridges or not, it's still going to freeze. And a all tell sign is when you don't see mist coming off the guy in front of you, he, you know, the the spray that comes off their trail or their tires will tell you that it's not frozen. But definitely, you want to have some kind of way of telling what the temperature is outside. So, just just keep in mind these things, drivers, and you can get through it. And I'll tell you the best advice: when you know it's about to freeze, get off the damn road. Get in a get in a parking yeah, spot. Yeah, you're not really really in black ice and 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 freezing rain and sleet. You you really are a little bit. You're brave, but you're really not proving anything. Many drivers have thought they've handled it before. They're going to handle it again. And then some dumbass wrecks in front of them. Yeah, you can't judge other persons. Yeah, you don't know that the guy driving down the road is going to slide underneath you. You're better off. That's my advice. Get off the road Mm -hmm. when you know you're about to be in a situation like that. And if you have a CB, turn your damn CB on Mm -hmm. and listen to advice and give advice. Be, Be part of... Be part of helping each other. So moving on. Moving let's, on. Let's move on. Moving on. Let's talk about this on. trucker. He he hit the lottery. A trucker hit the lottery. Is that the one that's in Southern Florida? No. No. <gasps> well, you've seen one, a trucker hit the lottery in Southern Florida? He was, it was in the Miami Herald, so maybe, maybe it wasn't the same. Your your mic is awful low. It was in my in the Miami Herald. So maybe it wasn't the same driver. Here, I'll turn it up for you. I'm sure it was the same driver. I mean, how many truck drivers hit the lottery? No, this was in Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or Maryland. It happened. Virginia. Oh, is he from? I think so. Okay. And so, you know, it it was 50 grand. He didn't, he didn't hit it for much. But 50 grand to somebody is a lot of money. To me, if I hit 50 grand, I'd be like, yeah. 
I wouldn't stop working though. I would just invest it. Well, how would you stop working with fifty? Grand? That's what I'm saying. We, I wouldn't stop working. The only way, if if you hit for fifty grand and you're going to quit working, you're here's the steps to do that: um, buy a tent, <laughs> a fishing pole. <laughs> And um, stay off the grid because fifty grand ain't gonna last you long. Um, and and <laughs> just read this article. It says trucker won fifty grand um, on a run through Maryland. This happened in October. Thirty-five year old truck driver from Lorton, Virginia. Oh, okay. Lorton, L-O-R-T-O-N, Virginia. Um, he wouldn't disclose his name. Yeah, what well, I mean that's to me that's smart because. You know, they say you want to get a lot of friends, hit the lottery. And most people that have ever won the lottery, they've they've said, I had more friends than I ever knew I had. And family, everybody wanted to I get a... I wouldn't give my name out. I don't know why your mic is doing that. I don't know, because I haven't moved. Yeah. And I'm not being soft. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's... Oh, all right. So, anyways... Uh, so he hits for fifty grand. Well, let's talk about the winnings of fifty thousand dollars. I had a friend when we were kids, Ronnie, mm-hmm. <laughs> my friend. He um, used to be like big time playing in Pennsylvania. They have the lottery every the everyday lottery. It's like a three digit draw, draw they do. Mm-hmm. And I think you win five hundred bucks for a dollar. I don't know if they still do it, but but then they had what was called the Big Four, and he used to play like four and five dollars. And one day he goes, I hit it, I hit it. He hit for twenty eight thousand dollars. Yeah, twenty eight grand. What he failed to realize was all twenty eight thousand dollars was not his. Uncle Sam wanted his piece, and he didn't pay. <laughs> and of course, he got in trouble. Um, and I, he actually ended up getting out of it. But still, this guy hit fifty thousand. This trucker hits fifty grand. Um, I will guarantee you that at least. Ten or fifteen thousand dollars goes to Uncle Sam. So even though you won fifty grand, let's just start there, trucker. Okay, you're probably good for thirty, thirty-five thousand. And the first thing that I would have done was go contact an accountant and find out. Okay, how much do I need to put back? Because I'd be writing a check out right away. Because at the end of the year, if you blew all that money. And, and, and again, I don't know. Sometimes I think states will collect it now for you. Mm-hmm. But if they don't collect it right there. It's like they give you the option. Right. Can it's, I write your check without the taxes or do you want me to just give you the whole thing and you pay it separately type of situation? I would, I would definitely tell them if you can, if you can, when you collect your money, let them get their part. Because at the end of the year, after you've pissed the money away. You're going to regret it big mm-hmm. time because the IRS will, will, will haunt you. Um, so it says he wanted to remain uh, anonymous. Uh, it says, like everyone else, uh, I have been buying Powerball tickets, trying to hit the Powerball. But I guess that he, big one that we had going on. I guess he bought a scratch off because that's where I think you win 50 grand. Um, he said, I never expected to hit the jackpot. But here's what I wanted to talk to, talk to him about. They're considering spending the winnings on a new car. I mean, listen, the worst thing you can buy is a new freaking car. All right? Maybe that's what they need, though. I don't care. Use part of it as a down payment and go make payments on a car. And take that money and invest it. I mean, for real. Yeah. Or buy something that's going to last. Why buy a car in five freaking years? It's it's worn out anyway. Or pay off your house. Yeah, or or put it down on a house. You know, you, if you're buying a house, you're actually paying yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a it's good... It's an investment. Yeah, an IRA. Or or pay off your, you know, some of your debts. Or whatever the case is. But buying... I, I just don't think personally... Listen, you're not... Buying a car is crazy. Well, here's the thing. The reason I said maybe maybe they can't get financing to do mm-hmm. you know everybody can be fine i don't yeah but you don't want to pay the interest rate everybody can do it yeah but the interest rate is outrageous with some of them yeah, but these slime ball automakers and auto dealers and they are slime balls okay every one of them and if you're an auto dealer yes you're a slime ball i i've worked for them i know what they do uh, they just threw something out to make appeasement to people all i'm saying knows? is you know they are willing to sign their 
firstborn kid away to get to get somebody approved on a loan believe me if you go into a car dealership and and you can fart and chew gum at the same time you're gonna get a car (laughs) that's just the freaking truth about it so but anyways i i would just say don't don't spend your money on on a new car no that's just crazy but anyways that's pretty much the podcast today uh, do you have the word of the day, Ruthann? I do. You do? Awesome. Do you, do you want me to tell people how they could do the loves 12 days of Christmas? Yeah, let's save that for the next podcast. We're actually almost an hour into this podcast. Okay. So we will be on the next podcast. Just so you know, Ruthann will have the 12 days of... Actually, you know what? We're going to do the 12 days of Christmas on this next podcast that we're going to, we're, we're doing two podcasts today here today Mm -hmm. and that one will be put up first. Okay. Yeah. That'll be put up first. That way they know about the 12 days of Christmas and then we'll put this podcast up next week. So that's how we're going to do it. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. Alrighty. Sounds good. So what's the word of the day? Deucedly. 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 Mm-hmm. Does it have something to do with the number two? Nope. No. Like when you drop a deuce? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> a number two? I thought you were really going to say deuce Bigelow at first. <laughs> ah. No, it's to mean quite or extremely or utterly. That was the light is deucedly bright. So it means utterly or extremely, mm-hmm. deucedly, deucedly. So extremely. So when you say something stre- extreme, it's deuced or deucedly. After a few early wins, I had nothing but deucedly bad luck in the casino. Tyrone didn't want to miss the concert, but he had a deucedly persistent head cold. Mm-hmm. Okay, awesome. I may I may use that one. Deucedly, deucedly, Ruthann. Welcome back, Troy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We're out of here. Peace. Peace. Praise the Lord.